You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. Welcome along, folks, to a brand new Straight to Video podcast with me, Rob Lane, and I really appreciate you tuning in. On today's show, I get to welcome guitarist and songwriter Greg Hart from the band Cats in Space. We had a really fun chat just prior to the band heading out for their first live show of the year at the Pentridge Rock and Blues Festival. And for me, this was really interesting to deep dive into Greg's history and learn all about the various bands he's played in since the 70s from hard rock and heavy metal acts, the AOR scene of the late 80s and early 90s, right through to today and the formation of Cats in Space, who really do take the term classic rock seriously. The band take elements from the real larger-than-life arrangements of bands like Queen, Boston, ELO, Supertramp, all that kind of stuff. There's some serious talent and musical history in the songs of this band. Cats in Space have just released a new version of their debut hit Mr. Heartache which is taken from their new compilation album Diamonds and you can grab your copy direct from the band's website at catsinspace.co.uk. A couple of shout outs before we dive into my chat with Greg. The great folks over on the Straight to Video Patreon page continue to show some great support for the show. We have an exclusive Facebook group set up so it's always cool to share up to date news along with an exclusive podcast episode, early news on guests and you can also grab some exclusive merch not available anywhere else. For more info on that simply head on over to patreon.com forward slash stvpod. And our friends Dead Skull Coffee continue to support the show by offering you a 15% discount on their ground or full bean coffee. Dead Skull Coffee are a great independent company with a real rock and roll attitude so please show them support by grabbing some coffee from their website deadskullcoffee.co.uk and when you add the promo code STV on checkout then you'll get that mighty discount. And finally, just before I headed out to do some live gigs last weekend, I stopped by to see my friend Neil at Newtone Strings who make the highest quality handmade guitar and bass strings for all musicians. We got talking about the podcast and he said he'd love to support the show so if guitar or bass is your thing then please check out newtonestrings.com and if you add the code STV10 on checkout then you'll grab a discount there too. All right, that's more than enough pimping. Let's get into today's chat. So sit back and enjoy my straight to video talk with Cats in Space guitarist Greg Hart. You said that I could stay to get myself together. A place to rest my head through all the stormy weather but every room i tried i couldn't stop the pain you promised sunshine but it only looks like me and now i've learned i've got to turn and walk away and say goodbye to Mr. Honey I don't need you anymore So like Mr. Honey Now I'm walking out the door And just for the record No one really likes you around here I believe Cats in Space were formed in West Sussex Is that where you're from originally too? Yeah, I mean, it's, I wouldn't say it was formed here, just that I, that's where I live. But the band's kind of global, really. We've got guys in London, South End, down on the coast. And obviously, Jeff lives in Belgium. So when well, he moved to Belgium, just when the band started, which was good, but he was getting married. So he now lives out there. So yeah, we're kind of, yeah, we're just generally based all over the place, really. Is that where you grew up, though? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm from, I'm from Sussex, yeah. Moved to London, moved about all over the place, and then eventually moved back, oh, God, I don't know, 15 years ago, something like that. Do you have any particular fond memories of your time as a kid there before music came along? Yeah, I had a good, yeah, I was right, a good childhood. Good, good. I've still got some of my oldest mates from when I was like five, six years old. So, yeah, but that's the good thing about being around here is that you kind of, you still got your good core of kind of back, you know, friends and background kind of thing. So it's really good. Do you grow up with brothers and sisters or are you only child? Yeah, two brothers. My eldest brother was the one that got me into music so he's seven years older than me so I was listening to stuff really 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 young so I, I can remember I can still remember when the Beatles were going just about because I can remember stuff like Hey Jude and Let It Be 
and Herman's Hermits and the Rolling Stones. I can remember that from a really, and then Lulu and Andy Williams. And my brother had very eclectic taste, he did, but he was a big New Seekers fan and stuff like that. But then he'd come home with Fireball by Deep Purple. So I think he brought that to impress his mates at school. Yeah, you were a Deep Purple fan. Because <laughs> that's quite a big age difference, isn't it? Especially when, if you're like a young boy, if someone's seven years older, that's a lot of influence. Yeah, my middle brother was, he's like three years older than me and he was kind of in the middle. He, he ended up going down the Elvis Presley kind of route, but he loves everything. He loves Status Quo and Alex Harvey Band was his favourite band. So I I was copying it all always, really. Yeah, from a very young age. And then I kind of just, the kind of the common bond that we all had between us was we all loved Slade and Sweet. Because Glam Rock was out then sweet were just like that was it but they were everything that's what got me into music in the first place yeah we were obsessed with them and i can remember the sweet way before little willie even because my eldest brother he he had he was buying the records when they were doing stuff like alexander graham bell and coco and tom tom turnaround i think so and then he said oh they've gone electric or something like that one day and then he brought a wigwam band and that was like a massive turning point wigwam band was because it was like at that riff you know and that was it yeah so huge huge sweet fan what was the moment for you though was it seeing a picture of them or uh, seeing them on top of the pops or something like that it was top of the pops with um steve priest with the indian headdress and mick tucker with his hair in pigtails i think with that big old drum kit and it was just game changing up until then it, you didn't really there's a bit of Mark Bolan and stuff like that, but he was also into, like, I don't know, you had all your easy listening stuff on Top of the Pops as well. You know, I think Gary Glitter was kind of out, but I wasn't really too bothered about him, to be fair. Even then, we, he said he looked stupid with that wig on, you know. 70s Top of the Pops has got a lot to answer for. A lot of people have got into bands that way, seeing them kind of live on TV. I oh, know, it's madness. You know, then, because obviously with Sweet, you were, you know, before long, you had like Mud, a oh, massive Mud fan. I love Mud, really, really like Mud, because they were good fun and you know great players and stuff and then you know hello and chicory tip and all the all the one-off stuff as well so it's just a it was a brilliant time for music that you kind of soak up and even today you know i'm constantly going to those pots of influence when we're doing stuff you know i'm always joking to people saying oh what's your new album sound like and i always say oh it's gonna be possibly gladys knight and chicory tip you know or the osmond and the Drifters, you know, or Gilbert O'Sullivan, you know, because melody, you know, it's exactly. all about melodies. And I believe your first single was Slade, right? And the first album was Aladdin Sane by Bowie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Very well done. Yeah, Slade, well, the, the annoying thing was my first proper single was Goodbye to Jane and it jumped. So I took it back and it jumped again. And my brother then went and got it changed a third time and he said they'd sold out. So I got your Crocodile Rock by Elton John. I was like, oh, great. So I didn't mind Elton John. I love Elton John now, but that song's a bit twee. That bloody thing jumped as well, and I was stuck with Crocodile Rock that jumps. <laughs> I had a few records like that, and I used to listen to them so many times, you kind of got used to the jump. Then when you heard it properly, you're like, wow. <laughs> yeah, I can still hear it now. I can hear the the, the try rocking bit on the last bridge. Yeah. And then Aladdin Sane was the first album I got for my birthday, and I was 10, I think it was, and that was his new album out then. Um, and I'd heard, obviously, Gene Jimmy came out, which is brilliant, but it was Driving Saturday, that's the track. That's my favourite Bowie song ever. And was it a combination of the visuals and the music as well? Like, holy crap, what is this I'm holding in my hand? I think it was, but the, the, the funny thing was, I've, I've bored people with this story before, but the funny thing was Bowie came from the same area as my family in South London, and it transpired, no less, my auntie moved into a basement flat after he moved out when he was called David Jones. And he left behind a load of rubbish, as you do when you move out of the flat, and that's to clear all the rubbish out. Oh, man, there might be some treasure in there. We're talking 66, 67, something like that period of time, before he was David Bowie. Can you imagine what might have been in that rubbish? Might have been the original Space Oddity or something like that. So the other trend, oh, yeah, yeah, he used to live in my flat down in um, near Penn. Just so matter of fact, no big deal. Yeah, I said, David Bowie, you know, but it's, um, but yeah, that was a, a great album. And that, that started the floodgates after that. I was just, everything I could spend my money on was music, you know. Where did you buy all your records from? Did you have a regular record shop, which you visited every Saturday morning or something like that? Well, Horsham, we had three good record shops 
one was an electrical shop that had listening booths upstairs, and there was an independent one. Then we also had boots, and we also had a very, very small WH Smiths back then in an old listed building. It was a tiny little one, but that had a few records in. And then they moved into town. So, yeah, there was always places to go. Then, of course, I'd go to Crawley or Croydon. If we went up to Croydon with my mum and dad, I'd be straight round to, I think it was Cloaks, was it? But there was three or four in Croydon. So, yeah, it was always going up there. You know, looking through the racks and stuff. Awesome. Where are your friends into the same sort of stuff? Or is you like sharing records and oh, you got to listen to this if you like that. You got to listen to this. That yeah, we did. I mean, when we when we was at junior school, you know, bearing in mind it was popular music, so we was all listening to chart music. It just had to be glam rock. So everyone loved it. You know, the, even the, the girls in the class, you know, they, they loved Alvin Stardust and stuff like that, and David Cassidy and Donny Osmond. But it was all good music, so everybody loved everything. You know, Ten CC, Bring Out Rubber Bullets, and for that week at school, all we ever talked about was you know, rubber bullets for 10 that's it was that in football you know that's all it was and like you say like your first records Slade and Bowie it's like you could say you're setting the bar pretty high but that's kind of a re- like you say it's a reflection of what was coming out at that time everything was good quality oh god yeah when you look at the, the classic albums that came out in just one year alone like say Picky Year 1976 <laughs> the, the albums that came out in that year is astonishing and they still are the best albums ever you know I, I won't list them because there's loads but you know you've got two Thin Lizzy albums for start ufo rush queen kiss black sabbath you know led zeppelin you know where, where does it end bowie you know everybody elo classic albums that came out between 71 and 79 is it's astonishing i don't care anyone says it's never been bad you know very few albums in the 80s and 90s can truly hold a candle to to those classic albums you know and indeed the beatles albums before that you know exactly and at what point like you say music became all consuming for you at what point did you decide right i want to have a crack at this and start learning an instrument literally about wigwam band when i was nine literally that was it the path was there and i've never deviated i mean it was just a matter of my, my dad was a guitar player so he taught me well for about a month and i got bored because he was trying to teach me scales on this little acoustic guitar and it was just rubbish and all i wanted to do was get him to teach me shangalang you know and he wouldn't do it because he's a jazz guitar player and he just went oil and water never shall the two meet so in the end he stopped teaching me and I kept the acoustic guitar and was just twanging away but I didn't really do it that seriously until I got my first electric which was like a, a Woolworths electric audition which I'm sure loads of people might remember those down in, in the local branches and once I got that a kiddie at school, a good friend of mine called Paul Zetta, who's one of my oldest friends, he got a bass guitar and we decided to learn together and we were going to be the new Lennon and McCartney. And to be fair, Paul is a musical genius. He, as it transpires, he's an incredible, incredible all-rounder, piano, bass, guitar, you name it. He was learning at such a faster rate than I was. He was teaching me in the end. So without him, I don't know if I'd ever got off the blocks. But yeah, so the path was there from a very young age and never really wanted to do anything else, to be fair. Did you guys form any bands together? Yeah, our very first band, me and Paul, when we were learning to play, we formed our first band, which was called Infrared. And we actually did a couple of gigs as well when we were about 15, maybe. When we kind of left school, we kind of broke up, stayed buddies, but he went down the jazz path. In fact, he, my dad was a mentor to him. And uh, I went off into the... You know, the Kiss and the Cheat Trick and Queen and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, we that was our first band. Superb. And what kind of concerts did you had a chance to see at this point? Had you got a chance to see bands play live? My first concert was Queen at Earl's Court, 1977. Not a bad start. And my second gig was the Live and Dangerous tour, which was Robbo's last gig with Finn Lizzie. Not bad. And my third gig was Rush Hemispheres tour. And my fourth gig was Boston at the Rainbow. Wow. Beat that. Any notable support bands at any of those shows or can't you remember? Queen didn't have a support band. Lizzie had horse lips who were pretty good. But that was all about Lizzie. But you know, get off. You know. Rush had Max Webster who was superb. They were, and we were right down the front for Max Webster. In the days when you could stand up down the front at Hammersmith and Max Webster come on and did Paradise Skies and everybody went and bought that picture disc. Brilliant that was. I don't recall Boston having the support. I might be wrong on that one, but I don't recall seeing the support band for that. How was Boston live, just out of interest? Because Tom Schultz has got all that known for his sound and recording techniques. Unbelievable. And I, I'm pretty sure that tour, they only did a couple of dates, Manchester and London. Didn't they? I'm pretty sure they did a couple of numbers in that show that they've never done since that remain unrecorded. I'm not sure on that. That might be a boffin question, but I know they definitely played a couple of songs that weren't on either of the two albums, but... I just remember smoking 
and that bit in the middle, he goes into a big organ solo and it just rumbled the walls of the rainbow and it was like, oh, this is amazing. I remember Dan Delp waving to us as well at the end when they went off. Real fanboys, you know, in our Afghan coats and uh, he, he looked back and waved to us as he walked off. We thought, oh, it's the best thing ever. So you had the band, we say it was infrared with your friend. Yeah, the pool, yeah. But then you had some bands, early bands, a group called Snowblind and then is it Icemon? Is that pr- how you pronounce it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both in the early 80s. How do you know this? I do a bit of research. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, yeah. I, um, I was, yeah, Snowblind was, um, yeah, we formed that uh, early part of 1980, I think it was. And we just became like a Thin Lizzy wannabe band, really. That's all we wanted to be. And then Iron Maiden kind of came along. We went a little bit more down that route with the two guitar thing. And yeah, that was a really good band. And then when we folded, I wanted to go into like a more AOR thing. And that's when I met Andy Stewart working in Dixon's. And he came and joined Icemon, as it was. Terrible name. And we wanted to be the next Asia. So that was that, really. And yeah, he's been with me pretty much ever since. Also. Thinking back to that time, what was the reaction to your bands? Because I know when I first started to see like local bands, just as we were heading into the 90s when I first started going out to gigs, it was still a really big deal, at least for me, to see someone playing in a band. Now, everyone knows someone who's playing in a band. It's like, oh, I play in a band. It's no big deal. But I can remember it just being amazing just to see this local band up there on stage. It was a big deal. Yeah, it's a good point because back then we could we had a couple of local pubs that would have 150 people in the back room. And they would, it wouldn't be like, oh, there's no one in tonight. It would always be busy. It was just taken for granted. You'd get a couple of hundred kids along to a local show. And it was always like, oh, has he got a real Gibson? Has he got a real Marshall? And how many effect pedals has he got? So it was always people checking it out. And we go, oh, have you seen so-and-so band? Well, yeah, what they like. Oh, apparently he's got a flying V. So you go on to check out his flying V, you know. It's all that kind of stuff. And I had a, a Les Paul. Pro- I was probably the, one of the first kids in the town to get a proper Les Paul. So I became a bit of a, a bit of a legend for a while. And then my mate got a, a custom. You know, this is when people still had Les Paul copies. So, yeah, we were, we were going for it. But then I've, I've always done that. You know, if you're going to do something, do it properly. You know, just go for it. There's no point pussyfooting around. But, yeah, gigs back then were brilliant. And, yeah, you get people that would stand at the back with their arms folded and kind of go, oh, not very good. Oh, he missed a note there, you know. But in general, people would be very supportive. And you'd sell cassettes and little button badges and stuff and hope that someone from... Kerrang would come down and review your gig, you know, which they never did. At what point did you start venturing into London? Which band was that? Would that be once you started Maritz? Yeah, that was Maritz. When we put Maritz together, then it became the crazy times. Yeah, that was that was when I finally got with people that really wanted to do what I wanted to do. So we had half of what was Icemond and half of what their band was. And we formed this big six-piece journey kind of survivor type thing and we got really good i mean we had trouble with singers and the revolving drummer kind of scenario but the band itself was really good and mike nolan is a phenomenal guitar player i mean he's you know he really is quite an astonishing guitar player so we had him you know doing all the shanker solos and stuff and me and ian doing the most of the songwriting and yeah we were a good band you know we we could have we could have done a lot better but we were in competition with the likes of FM back then and Strange Ways and Virginia Woolf and The Shy. I mean, it was a brilliant time for music. Being in London in 86, 87, 88 was the golden time, really. But you're in so much competition with these bands to, to get a record deal. We never quite got there, unfortunately. Did you always like the songwriting creative process? in a band did you always like taking that on yeah I mean that's what I do I mean the whole vehicle for me is is songs you know I mean with that song you haven't got nothing you know I mean it's if I'm writing the songs and and the band's good and they're putting the songs over how I hear them in my head that's my job really that's what I want to do so yeah I mean it was always about just crafting songs and not copying everybody else too much and not just trying to do the usual same thing. And that is the thing, I think, what happened with the AOR thing in the UK, why it never quite took off, was that everyone was trying to do the same thing. You know, it was like no one was trying to stick their head above the, the turret quite enough. You know, you had FM and that was about it, really. And we were trying to be just a little bit different because we've, you know, even... In the 80s, we were always saying our influences aren't from the 80s. We're still trying to take in the classic 70s AOR, like Boston and Foreigner, you know, some obscure bands that I used to like, like LaRue and Roadmaster and Stars and that kind of stuff. And those little influences used to make us a little bit different. But unfortunately, in 87, 88, people didn't want different. You had to follow that generic 
kind of thing, you know, which we didn't really want to do. And I guess everyone was starting to look towards America as well for that influence because it was growing so big over there. And I've always wanted to be a little bit different, just yeah, you know, just enough to say, well, we do that, and people would say, oh, that sounds like so and so, rather than we just sound like FM. And that's all we used to hear. We just sound like FM. So it didn't really work out for us in that respect. You guys did record an EP though and shot a video. You said the band eventually disbanded. Was it a surprise to you to find years later that the band had, I think it like developed kind of a cult following and the EP would become quite collectible, right? Yeah. Well, that's how Rob Evans got involved. You know, I've known Rob for quite a while now, but I didn't really know him back then. But as I've always said, when you look back on a movement and it's all boxed up, you can then pick the bits out. It's like the new one of British heavy metal. When you're in it, at the time it's just going on and you don't really have a chance to be considered unless you're right at the top like Iron Maiden or whoever but 25 years later when that's all done and dusted and people box it up and say that was then you can then pick who was good at and Moritz ended up being like that you know when all that AOR thing died in the UK Later on, they were picking about all the good bands. Oh, yeah, and Moritz were really good, weren't they? But at the time, we were always not quite getting where Shy were or Strange or whatever. So I think that's a, a very interesting thing. You know, it's only when you look back that you can see the pecking order, if you like. Was you kind of ringing everybody? Hey, you've not got any boxes of the EP in your garage somewhere, have you? These things are going for good money. I'm normally the man that's got it. I'm the man with the box normally because I'm very clever with keeping stuff. But at that point, no, I had a white label test press of the Brit CP. I was scouting on eBay. <laughs> I was buying them off of eBay. A few things turned up, but I I actually, one of my things is I, I do sell vintage vinyl. Oh, very cool. One of my sidelines. So I'm quite knowledgeable in the history of collectible vinyl. So I'm dealing with that quite a lot of the time on the side. So I don't miss many tricks. I, I could bore you to tears with that side of things. But yeah, I know I know all the bands that are out there now where their collectible stuff is, you know, Little Angels, you name it. I can tell you where their money is. Oh, wonderful. When did you get into that? Is it something you always like? You always collected records? Yeah, I've always retained it. Like as, as, as a kid, I was a collector, so I've always retained it and I've learned about it. And of course, when eBay started up, hunting ground, wasn't it? It was like, here we go. And I knew what I was doing. And my friend that I have this business with down on the south, we kind of uh, do all right with it, really. I mean, he's probably the top record seller in the country on eBay and we do very well. But we are knowledgeable, you know, we've learned about it and I love it. I mean, I. I I, I love learning about catalogue numbers and matrix numbers and first pressings and stuff. But I didn't realise the Maritz CP was worth 50 quid until someone actually told me that. And I was like, what? Do you still like going into record shops whenever you can find one? Always. Yeah, yeah, still go to record shops, record fairs. People try and sell us stuff all the time. So, yeah, we've got thousands of albums. I've got thousands here that we trade and sell and move about and stuff, rare stuff, anything up to, you know, 10 grand albums. We've got the record for the highest price ever, Stereo, Please, Please Be, Beatles album. We've got the record on that. I won't divulge anymore, but we've we've sold it for the highest price on Discogs. Look on Discogs or Pop Psych, we'll be there on a lot of stuff. Yeah. Do you ever get attachment to physical music? Yeah, I mean, I picked up a mint copy of Love Gun with the gun the other day, a UK pressing, pie pressing, and I've not seen a gun in a Love Gun album for oh, 30 years probably. And I took the gun out and went make sure I didn't work it but yeah that that one was hard yeah that was hard but we had to sell it but I've got I've just picked up a first edition Kiss Originals as well which is the first three albums in a wallet sleeve the one that came to the UK tended to be the second edition but we got hold of the first edition from America and it's in really good nick as well so that's with the, all the bits inside as well new treasures to be found all the time oh it's out there it's it, it's big business it's modern day antiques as we've been saying for years it's the, there's more money in classic vinyl now than teapots and bits of china you know it's, it's there's big money if you know what you're doing it funds things it helps fund the music business because there's no money in the music business or very little you know so you have to fund it the way you can you know yeah i think it's good for like creative people to have these different avenues of income yeah, yeah. coming in different streams for sure after Moritz, you had a band called if only with jackie from girl school how was your feeling about the music at that time because i know you've shared your frustrations with the musical climate of like was everything becoming the same or yeah it was getting ridiculous we started an album in 89 i didn't finish it till 91 and we watched grunge come in and we spent a fortune on that album and it was a brilliant album jackie ended up leaving when it was complete and then we had to get tina in to revocal it and spend another load of money it was a bonkers time it really was but we watched MTV on the screens in the studio and just watched this Nirvana record, Pearl Jam, I think it was. They just started getting on heavy rotation. We're going, this don't bode well. And it didn't, you know. So, yeah, I was 
completely cheesed off of it all by then. It was just, you, you were writing generic stuff because you had to. I, I can remember having a meeting with our record company and I had half the band. Funny enough, I wanted Dean Howard to come on board with me then because he had left to Powell then. And we wanted to put together a band that was just like a straight out and out rock band like Thin Dizzy or UFO would have been. And they went, no, you can't just shelve off two years of an album to suddenly do that. I said, that's dead. I know it's expensive, but it's dead. And it was dead. It was totally dead. And had it have seen the vision, we could have probably gone out and done what Thunder had done because we had we had it in place, but it never came to light, unfortunately. It was a shame. You know, it's just when you had the Les Pauls back and everybody started to sling the guitars down low again rather than have them up here and playing whammy bars and wearing their mum's blouses, you know. Because the 90s were a strange playing field for a lot of musicians who had been working constantly in the 80s. There was, I guess there was a lot of reinvention, chasing trends and overall probably quite a bit of confusion for a lot of bands. How did you feel you handled that, being someone so passionate about music? Because you had the band GTS. Did you focus more on songwriting around that time and working with other people? No, I went completely bonkers because after If Only broke up, we formed that we was one of the first tribute bands, a glam rock tribute band called Flares. And anybody that knows Flares down this way will just suddenly go, oh my God, because someone described us as a cross between Guns and Roses and Bernard Manning on speed. And that, and that was exactly what we were like. We did all these glam rock songs. Bear in mind, nobody was doing tribute stuff then, bar the odd Beatles or ABBA thing. And we were going out into these clubs and playing Alvin Stardust, Mud, Sweet, Slade, Gary Glitter, Hello, you name it. Mott the Hooper, we're doing all these classic 70s things, wearing all the gear, all the face paint, all the flares, handmade suits, and we were packing places out. We ended up going into Butlins and things like that. But we were causing pandemonium in, in the pubs around the south of England, and we ended up making a professional career out of it for, well, till I left and joined Limehouse. And, and flares are still kind of going today of some description. But yeah, we did a couple of CDs. In fact, our first CD, I've heard that goes to like 100 quid. What's that about? It's only cover songs on there, but I, all the 90s was just basically spent in a drunken haze playing glam rock songs and going absolutely bananas. And it was brilliant. But I think I personally, I needed to do that after all the years of being serious and doing all this kind of AOR thing and not getting anywhere, it kind of, you know, bit me on the arse in the end. I just thought, I just need to go and let me air down. So we did, and it went nuts. That might have been a perfect time to do it. Well, obviously it was because the tribute band just yeah. exploded. Exactly. And everybody else that was in the music game that I knew then went back into day jobs or on building sites or they gave up music completely and sold all their gear. And I ended up doing the polar opposite. I ended up becoming successful doing that rather than doing that. And, you know, like I said, we were earning a living at it. You know, we had, had our own company and I bought more guitars and it enabled me to do things up and down the country every week of the year. You know, Christmas, we'd do 20 gigs a month, you know, and we were rocking proper. And then every now and again, I'd get this craving to want to do some original stuff. And that's why GTS became a nice little side project I did in the days off that I went on the road. Excellent stuff. So how did you and Mick Wilson from 10CC hook up to begin to, I guess, set the seeds of what would become Cats in Space? Again, we went to see uh, the band in concert and just marvelled at this Mick Wilson geezer that was doing everything, just like a performing monkey going nuts with his percussion tree and beautiful voice. We kind of met up with him and he came and wrote some songs with Janie Bombshell, who was doing an album with, and he came on board and the three of us wrote some songs and he sang a bit and we just became really good buddies. One day I just got this idea to do some songs totally in the vein of what I grew up with, you know, like 10CC and Andrew Gold, Pilot and Super Tramp, and wanted to do something that was totally, as I've said many times, it's something totally from for me, selfish, really. Not compromising, not trying to have any big plan, not trying to do what was current, just do something that was so out there, probably no one would even like it, but hey, let's do it. And so we did. And we just started writing the songs and we just realised straight away we had this really good chemistry going. And that was it. That's how Cats in Space was born. How was that for your songwriting? Did it just come naturally to go back to that or and it's how you'd always written or did you have to shed some of the things, maybe habits you'd become accustomed to over the past 10 or 15 years? Yeah, good point. That's a very good question because you have to limit yourself what you're allowed to do in that format. So you go in and go, and every now and again, I'd venture off into like a survivor mid late. Go, no, 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 don't do that. As I've always said, the stuff that you see on the cutting room floor sometimes is more interesting than the finished thing because it's the dead ends that are quite interesting. Like we've done songs where we've gone on, done this, not being 100% about it, but said, we'll work on that tomorrow. We'll come back to that. Then the next day you go and listen to it and go, no, 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 can't do that. That just sounds like that. 
So we had very strict parameters to say, if we're going to do it like the 70s, let's keep it strict. And therefore, I need players that will totally understand that as well and not try and bring in Joe Satriani or, you know, some drummer I don't know about. You know, you you had to have a head on it. And that's where Stevie came in because he's a cosy pal nut and Ian Pace, so and Roger Taylor. So he came, I mean, he plays the drums exactly. You couldn't wish to have a drummer play drums more like you need him to play than Stevie. I mean, so once we, me, Stevie and Mick were kind of in and Andy came on board, everyone else just kind of fell into place. Dean came in and Dean's like a big Joe Walsh fan and he plays really vintage style gear and that was brilliant. Jeff Brown, obviously, he was in the suite for many years, so he was just like a walking tornado, brilliant singer. And of course, Paul Manzi joined and he had that lovely voice that was quite unique, actually. You know, probably not the voice we thought we'd get for Cats in Space, but when he opened his mouth, we went, that's going to set us apart. And it did. So that all happened really quite easily, alarmingly easily, actually. The Cats in Space was formed, but it does all, again, stem back from the songs that me and Mick were writing at the time. So we knew we had some good songs. I had a few songs that I'd written in the Maritz that weren't going to be suitable and I'd just hone those into Cats in Space. And it, yeah, it happened really easily, which was remarkable after all these years of trying to force a square peg into a round hole. Now all of a sudden you're doing this thing that you're kind of almost doing it for a laugh and all of a sudden it gets really serious. And that's where we are today. I think you said like a lot of bands probably over the last 10 years or so, they've all gone for like a classic rock vibe, but not particularly with the elements that Cats in Space do with the tips of the hat to Queen and the, or- the whole orchestration and harmonies that go into your arrangement. So it is putting you on like a unique in your own little area. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, many people have we've had this conversation with and say, you know, why you know why are we the way we are it's it's just it's a hard one to explain we're of an age where we don't care we just don't care if people don't like us we really don't care sorry about that but we don't if people love us we really love us but we're not going to go pandering to the likes of certain people to fit a generic format just to get onto their platform there's no point that's not what we're about you know if i was going to do that i've done that 30 years ago it didn't work then so we do stuff that we like and if other people like it that's great and if they don't that's not a problem no we don't care in that taking that on board i don't feel peer pressure to have to make the guitars sound a certain way and the drums to sound a certain way in the production which i find 90 percent of it is very linear and one directional and it's it's good but it's there's nothing that's going that's really a cut above you know there's not there's not that much going on and i think it's mainly because of peer pressure to fit a, a certain format to get onto certain platforms or it's because they don't have the age and experience of knowing where we come from for instance or as someone once said possibly the ability but i'm not saying that in a negative big headed way you know not many bands probably could go in and do some of the stuff we do you know we've got people that are incredibly experienced musicians and we've learned our craft and i'm a brian may fanatic and yeah okay so shoot me i like doing those of brian may harmonies not all the time they're not done just gratuitously they're done because it will excite that song that we're doing and we do sound a bit like queen so and like I said, if we do sound a bit like Queen and people say that, I mean, what bigger compliment can you get? I don't say this. This is what people say about us. I don't say it. I say you're going with like, you're doing it for yourselves. And if people like it, that's great. But what was the anticipation about putting your first material out, such as like Mr. Heartache? You know, for all the bravado and not caring, we cared a great deal when that record came out. Because I just thought, don't forget by then we had the album done and we were sitting in that little studio down in Lewis thinking, God, this is really good. I mean, I never expect us to come up with this. Yeah, but it doesn't mean anyone's going to like it. They might think, what the hell is that? So when Mr. Heartache came out, it wasn't just that song was coming out. There was this big thing behind it that was going to fall on its arse badly. Should they go, what the hell is that? And some people did go, what the hell is that? That's just a load of nonsense. But an awful lot of people just didn't know where it come from. But yeah, I, was, I remember going on holiday the week before it came out because I just needed to try and clear the decks kind of thing. And I spent the entire time panicking, thinking, it's got to work. We've done 20 grand on this. We spent all our money, you know, we've invested, all our savings have gone into this band called Cats in Space that was only done for a laugh. And now all of a sudden it has got a bit serious. Yeah, we were nervous, but we were were even more nervous when the album went out because I really didn't know what people were going to make of it. And we were getting emails and things coming in almost straight away. And I thought, oh, that could be a good sign. 
and people were going absolutely nuts over it. How good does that feel? <laughs> Best thing ever, to be fair. After all these years of trying to do something and then finally doing something that really comes to the heart and something that, yeah, you do secretly care about it, but you're, you are doing it for a laugh. And I thought, well, it's just an album. Underneath it all, I was like going, I really want this to work. But we all came with it from the right place. So I think people that know our band, they understand that. They, that it's coming from the heart. It's not coming from any peer pressure. It's not trying to be anything other than what it is and that's what everybody said when they heard that first album they went what the hell is this this is unbelievable how have you done it you know and I said it's it's honest it sounds a bit like Queen we'll slag us off for it I don't care I like to see someone else try and sound a bit like Queen there's also the added well connection and also I guess pressure as well because you've totally embraced the whole DIY ethic of the band by keeping as much as you can in-house. When did you decide that that DIY model was the best way forward for you? Is that from years of experience dealing with labels, but also seeing things and learning and thinking, I could do that myself. No need getting somebody else in. Yeah, it's a double-edged sword. The good side is you have total 100% control of your finances, how you spend money, who does what, who you put your trust in, who you put your faith in, and having the artistic control over it, which between me and Stevie and Andy Kitson, we're very blessed with having three people that are very arty so we're, we're pretty good at doing that side of it I thought why do we need to pay someone else to do that why do we need a, a record label as a bank that charges you extortionate interest that's all it is the good side of a record label and the promotion behind a record label is they can one take hopefully some of the pressure off of you trying to do it and get you into the, the areas that maybe we can't but the downside is and through years of experience you're still reliant on some monkey there to do the work if that monkey ain't in that day the other monkeys don't like you so you, you tend to be reliant on the one guy that likes you. And if he's not there, you're stuffed. And I've seen that happen and bands collapse because of it. And I just won't have our products being mishandled. So we, we're not control freaks other than we have to be. Because as I've said many times, we go on the road and we sell T-shirts and that money comes to us. If we lose money on the road, it's our money. If we make money on the road, it's our money. And that money rolls over to the next album. And what we're building is a company and a business and a career, which which is why we're on album five and overall album seven, because we've been quite canny with that. The downside is we're very, very limited with where we can go with it, to be fair. At some point, we really need a leg up, but that leg up may never happen. So there's no point worrying about it until it happens, you know. But if you, as long as you've got that core audience who you're working with and towards, I think it's, I say the music industry is all over the place anyway now. Yeah, young bands, you know, I'd say that now. I said, there's no holy grail anymore. That's, those are gone. Yeah, you know, the 80s have gone. Yeah, you know, the 90s have gone. Yeah, you know, you're not going to go in and get a million pound record deal now. People don't want, want you to make a video even because what's the point? Because people haven't got the attention span of a video. They've got an attention span of 36 seconds or something. So you're doing videos because, well, we better do a video because that's what people expect you to be because otherwise you're not a serious band but that's dead money really you know you're better off spending it elsewhere you still have that kind of pressure to do things as things are but it's all over the shop and i would say if, if bands can do it themselves they've got the skill and the dedication and it is dedication you can't have one person in a band of five people doing it all you know you have to be on the same hymn sheet and you've all got to do your bit and you've got to have a good team behind you and if you can do that you're better off doing it yourself. The profit margins are there to speak for themselves. As long as you've got a good distribution, Cargo Records that do a great job for us and we, we have a great team there and we work really well and we do the usual stuff. But we know that every single sale that comes in from one of our records, we know it down to the penny. You know, and this is stuff that Danny, you know, when Danny was managing us, you know, he's the most shrewdest guy I've ever met. And he taught as well. You know, in many ways, I, I wish he was still our manager because he was such a good mentor. We got on really, really well. But, you know, it, it became unworkable due to just the way things turned out with Thunder and us. So, you know, it, but it's all cool. You know, there was no, nothing sinister about it. But he just said, I know where every penny of Thunder was. And if you know that, you're in good shape because you can decide what you can and can't do. And I know what we can and can't do. You know, we can do so much and there's certain things we can't do. But also, I've not got to go to ask someone, can we have a blue logo on our album sleeve? Because we really like blue. And they go, oh, no, no, we, we only want white on it. We don't have that. You know, if we want a scarecrow with things flying around and coloured vinyls and thing, you know, signed photos and cardboard things and we decide all that and we make it happen and we sell it. It's a very good place to be. I mean, saying about the artwork and stuff, the artwork for the new compilation, Diamonds, I think that perfectly captures the feel of the music and it's a great throwback to the music you love. It looks great. 
that's the best one which really nails the feel of everything you're going for. That's good for you to say because it's the one, I mean, Andy Kitson didn't do the artwork because we didn't want to confuse the compilation album with all the lovely artworks on the on the studio album. So we wanted to keep it a separate thing. But when we decided to do it, I said, it's got to look like a real classic k kind of 70s diamonds, the best of, you know. And it, again, it's tongue in cheek and we weren't sure whether it was going to even happen because it was originally just going to be a promo CD for Germany, you know, to get us out there with, with David because obviously the new lineup, you know, people listen to the old back catalogue is great, but they get confused over where we are now. So he said, Damien racked out those songs in a couple of days. I mean, the guy's a phenomenal talent. And he just literally, when he auditioned for the, we well, did audition, he, he came down and sang some songs and he sang four songs in about four hours. Done. They were just unbelievable versions. So we kind of said, we need to send them back to Germany. And of course, in the end, we said, well, we also need some money. If we do go to Germany, why don't we give the opportunity to the fans to have these songs so we did that we know people don't like messing with the history and I'm a firm believer that you shouldn't tinker with it as well but it was literally well if we don't offer the songs out and the fans get to hear about it they're going to go no oh, would it be nice of them to sell that so that's why we chose to do it in the end you know, it's a very limited release it won't be something that goes on and on it, it's a finite release I mean, you've been around for a while now, a few years, but um, you are still introducing yourself to new people all the time. Absolutely. You should never think that, every, well, never think that everyone knows who you are, not, not even a dot on the landscape, not, not by far. You know, I mean, we've seen bands come in and go above us because of the way that their, their trajectory worked at that particular time when we was off doing another album. Like when we did the Narnia album, as good as that was, that took us a year. We lost traction on the fact that we'd done all those high-profile support tours and we just could not get out on the road in 2017. No, 2018, sorry. Apart from one gig at Carefilly Castle. You know, we should have gone out and done a tour that year to capitalise on the Quo and Deep Purple and Thunder tours. We just couldn't get the position to do it and there were no support tours that year that came over that we could get onto. So it became a real fallow year. And so we picked up in 2019, of course, Paul leaves. And Mark Pascal joins us. Fine. Got to Christmas, then COVID came out. So on our timeline, we're kind of two years off the money. All we've managed to do is release records, but we've not managed to get out there into the field again. So, yeah, that's a bit of a bone of contention that we're, we've been forced upon, really. You know, we, we've lost a little bit of ground doing that, other than the fact that Atlantis is our biggest selling album without doing a gig. So in one hand, you're going, well, there must be the grounds force there to, to do that. But in the other way, we haven't been out to gig it yet. That might be quite exciting, though, because might. there's going to be that anticipation for people to see you. have got used to that album now. It's not like an album release, then the week later you're out on tour supporting it. People have had a chance to let all those songs sink in. Yeah, that, why, that's why we'll be doing, you know, four or five songs off Atlantis on the next tour, because it feels right to do that. But, of course, the downside of that is people are still very, very scared of the situation. And people aren't buying tickets still. So the big question here is, you know, we need to get people buying tickets for the gigs because they're frightened to at the minute. And venues have only just literally started to open up. So therefore, all your walking kind of footfall that sees all the gigs going on in the venues, that's literally only just happening as we speak. And there's very little time to make that into ticket sales. So we're under no illusion that our tour in September is going to struggle if we don't sell tickets and some of the gigs aren't open to sell the tickets yet. It's going to be an interesting one, this. I'm hoping the festivals over the coming weeks will give people a lot more encouragement and confidence to go, right, we're a little bit back to normal now. Let's go and start buying some tickets for these gigs because they will be on. Bear in mind, this is our third attempt at this tour. You know, and of course it becomes old news. You're looking at a tour poster now that's like, oh yeah, people are buying tickets for the new stuff that's being announced for next year because it's new. The stuff that's been moved and moved and moved, they're losing confidence in it because they've lost hotel money and, you know, babysitters or whatever. So we've got to try and still force that tour to be a success. So that's, we're under no illusion it's going to be tough. You're going to be excited to play. You'll be like, I'll play to five people. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Show me the receipts later. Right now, I just want to play. We start rehearsals this week, obviously, for the Rock and Blues Festival. We, we just can't wait because we've only been, we did the stream last year with Damien. So we've only actually physically as a band been together for four days. You know, rehearsals, stream, and then we got locked down again. So this is the first real time that we're going out with a purpose to play in front of an audience. You're going to be like 16 years old again, first game. I'll tell you what, that, yeah. I mean, all these years of like, you know, and the pool's knocked off you, you know, oh, you know, we're old dogs at this. We are, we, we do feel like new kids again. It's going to be such a new thing. I was noticed last night on the um, Steelhouse Festival, 
you, you could see a spring in the step of some of the bands on stage. They generally were a little bit giddy, you know, and I think it, that's amazing. It must be an amazing feeling. So we just can't wait to just to see the fans again and let them hear, you know, Too Many Gods and say hello again, you know, which is what we're going to do. Excellent stuff. I love it. Well, Greg, thanks ever so much for chatting with me. You enjoy the rest of your day. Take care, mate. See buddy. Say goodbye to Mr. Honey. Thank you so much to Greg Hart for joining me today on the Straight to Video podcast. Hope you all enjoyed hearing about his journey. And if you like the sound of Cats in Space, then be sure to visit catsinspace.co.uk where you can pick up their new compilation album Diamonds and find all their tour dates for the UK later this year. If you want to catch up on over 100 more episodes of this show, then please head on over to stvpod.com where you can find them all for free to stream along with Straight to Video music, video and merch. And I really do appreciate all your continued support, shares and messages on social media and everyone who's joined the Patreon page. All of you help grow this show and make it what it is, so thank you so much. And until we chat again, look after yourselves and I'll speak with you all real soon. Hold up. 